And here we're back with a really exciting panel. The ICANN may not be well known, but it's very important for internet concatenation. It's the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and we have a very exciting panel. We have the CEO of ICANN, who will be greeting our audience, and then two specialists and experts, the Vice President for Latin America, Rodrigo de la Parra, and Nicolas Antonielo, who is the... Um, the, who is uh, specialized in ICANN infrastructure. So I'd like to welcome you to this panel. Thank you. That's going to help me a lot. <laughs> I know. How are you? Where are you? I'm in Los Angeles. Thank you very oh, much. I'm fine. Okay. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, very good. We are okay. We, are, we survived the pandemic. We have... Okay, vaccinated, and luckily my family no 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 diseases, no no, no problems, and going out slowly but surely out of this uh, pandemic situation, and, and we're gathering together slowly, with, with not many people, but but we are here. And thank you for being with us. I know you have a very busy agenda, and I want to thank you for for your time. And let me tell you, we have 500 fellows from mainly Latin America, but from all over the world because it's virtual and we have translation. So that enables, you know, uh, no boundaries like, like the internet. And uh, the, the motto and the main issue of the whole week is how internet will be an issue, uh, a key element for the economic recovery of uh, the economies in Latin America. So you being the CEO of ICANN, maybe you can share some some comments and highlights about the role of the internet in the economy, and also um, congratulate ICANN for 23rd anniversary and five years, five years of the IANA transition. Is that it's five years? Yes, I think so. So thank you very much for being with us, and I know you're very busy, but uh, a few moments with, with you will enhance very much this panel about ICANN. And welcome to the school again, like last year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, so, I mean, first of all, I mean, you've given me a very hard task to, to talk about all those things in, in a short period of time, uh, and I will try to cover them uh, as much as I can. I mean, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be there. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is an important event, and, and, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. And I know my team thinks the same thing. And I'm sorry for my lack of Spanish. Uh, my, when my kids nowadays want to talk about me without me knowing about it, they actually speak Spanish. So I guess they're better educated than I am. You, you, you pointed on something that's very, very important and the role of the internet uh, in the world. Um, and, and I think that I, when I speak to, 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 to people who are who now gone virtual because many of us have, uh, during this pandemic time, it just shows how important internet is uh, as a part of our lives, which is quite remarkable uh, to the fact that when I grew up, there was no internet. I'm quite old. Uh, and, and we were, you know, we felt, I guess, I mean, sometimes I think about how would this pandemic be without the internet, um, the, the lack of any communication, the lack of uh, interaction with people. And, and one thing I just read an article about was that how important the, the internet was in actually when to fight the, the pandemic for vaccines, because of course, scientists and researchers around the world use the internet to share information, to share data, and to be able to pr produce a vaccines or several vaccines in a very short period of time. So what the internet is, you know, it's safely, it's, it's easy to say that the internet has become a very important part of our, our life. And, and today I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit from, from, from the technical aspect of it, the internet. And I'm going to talk about ICANN's role a little bit from a technical perspective, because sometimes we take things for granted. Uh, we take a lot of things for granted. Um, we, so ICANN is, is an organization or an institution that it's primarily, I often call it that we are, it's like a tree with two branches. And, and one of those branches we are often uh, that's what often we talk about. We talk about the DNS and the policy setting for DNS, which is an important part of what ICANN does. But we also have another arm, which I call the technical arm. 
Um, and the technical arm is, is where we often talk about stakeholders rather than the multi-stakeholder model. Every time you go online, regardless of which device you're using, which kind of network you're using, you hit upon something that originates from ICANN or our function for IANA. And, and many people, many don't think about that. Uh, and, and we are part of an ecosystem in the sense that, you know, technically we distribute those identifiers uh, through other policy making organizations like our colleagues in the numbers community uh, or the, the colleagues we have in the country code operators community who sets their own policies for it. But basically that is one of the reasons why the internet actually exists. And, and, and one of the things we're seeing now is that people is trying to, to to use that wording that we use when we call it the internet. They come up with things like new IP. They talk about, you know, which got nothing to do with IP. Uh, they talk about alternative internets, which is not the internet at all. And, and so a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about today is to remember the fact that the technology that's behind it is important to understand the internet governance as itself. Because when that moves on, the discussion about the internet governance moves on as well. So, I mean, the, so one thing that I want to also start out by saying is that ICANN is not alone in this. I mean, we work together with many technical organizations around the world, and that's actually one of the ideas behind the internet, uh, which I think has been, been very successful because we've been able to grow this technology together from, from the very few users to billions of users in a very short time frame. And the reason for that is that when it comes to how the internet actually functions, no one is in charge, the, which some people don't like, but most people do understand that that's a benefit. The, the internet itself is an asset that belongs to many, that's also a responsibility for many. Before I proceed, I also want to say that I spent this morning answering questions about one of the social media platforms outtakes yesterday. And, and I have no reflection on it. I, I, you know, uh, mistakes happen and I feel sorry for them. But it proves one point is that social media platforms are not the internet because the internet actually did work yesterday. Uh, when, you, when you are using the internet and you use a social media platform, and I use them as well. So I'm, I'm not saying that they don't have a big benefit. You actually leave the internet and you walk into someone else's computer where they set the parameters. So when I talk, the reason I'm putting this up is because I want to, you know, we are talking about the essential internet as well. So let's face it, not everybody are happy with the current situation where you have an interoperability, interoperable internet when people could go online on any device, any network um, to, and, and, and connect to people or communities around the world. Not everybody sees that as a potential. I mean, I sometimes say that for every nine good things that the internet provides also, there's a 10. Uh, that 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 ten bad things that sort of happens on the internet, and and that's important to 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 think about when you think about internet governance because a lot of the discussions today about internet governance are put from a negative perspective. There are things like fake news. There are you know illegal things happening on the internet as well as in in the real world, uh, but we shouldn't forget the benefits of the internet as well as we have seen during the pandemic. Sorry about that. So what we're seeing now, and, and one thing I'm going to specialize to talk about a little bit is that the internet governance discussion has started to move away from the traditional platforms they often have. Often they were, for instance, discussed within what we call the ecosystem uh, of, of the partners that we all engage in. And, and in my world, we all love acronyms. So of course, ICANN is an acronym, but we also have the RERs. Uh, we also have organizations like the ITF, we have ISO. Uh, IGFs and everyone else. And that used to be a very small environment that we all went together and solved problems. What is happening now is we're starting moving out of that one. We see proposals in, 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 in legislations around the world. Um, one of them is, for instance, the privacy legislations that now has a direct impact on ICANN's ability to make decisions. We see legislative proposals that actually uh, can have an impact on how ICANN runs uh, IANA or updates the root service. And by the way, there are regular proposals how also to regulate root servers around the world. That's something a little bit new that we now see. Many of those organizations are many of the legislators who come in don't usually come into the, don't see themselves as they're doing internet governance. They see that's doing something else. 
And there's something else happening as well. I mentioned before things like new IP um, or 5G or things where you actually see technical proposal as well. So they can have an impact on people's uh, ability to connect to the internet. Uh, and often they, as I said, they use words like remember or looks like the words we're using, but they're not really that. So a while back ago, we started, and this comes from standardization houses outside this ecosystem, outside the ITF and other places where we think, by the way, they belong because ITF has been successful or producing the standards for the internet world for, for a very long time. We all benefit of their hard work. But what we're seeing now then is that these discussions may have moved into other contexts, like the, the let's take the proposal for new IP, who comes from a manufacturer sponsored by governments and ends up in the UN discussion, not only in the ITU, but also the UN discussion. It's very clearly distinguished uh, what it's also about. The five year discussions is not happening within the ITF either. And there are proposals there which we believe kind of contradictory to the open internet as we see it. We, we named it and we call that the technical internet governance just to make the difference between the ordinary internet governance that we see. Uh, also to put out a point, there is a, if we want to preserve the open interoperable internet that we all seem to like, uh, then we should make sure that we actually understand the problem going forward. I'm supposed to give you know, Olga gave me a lot of things, you know, to mention on this one. There's one more thing I want to mention before we proceed, uh, and that I'm going to change the subject slightly, and that is actually talk about the internet as itself and what we do. One of the things that ICANN is now engaging in is what we, we call the next round, um, because we always love to figure out names that doesn't say anything to anyone outside the small ICANN community. But it's actually what it's all about, is that today there are about 5 billion internet users out there. And we have about 1,600 um, ways of identifying identifiers on the internet. And that number has been quite stable for the last couple of billion users that we added on. We created a scarcity for people's ability to have top level domains. The next round is really uh, to make sure that people who doesn't use, especially Latin script, uh, can utilize to build the communities on, their net, on the internet, either commercial, non-commercial, um, what we call top level domain, so you can come together under your own script, your own keyboard, your own narrative. This is going to be a very big enhancement of how internet users around the world can actually make sure that they can connect to the internet and preserve what I believe is one of the strongest points of the internet, the diversity of the internet, the ability for people to express commercial views, private views, or any opinions in their own communities. That is the next round, which I think is so important for all of us. Just to leave you with the fact that less than 20% of all email service in the world uh, can read um, Chinese script. And if I remember correctly, about 15% of all the email service in the world can actually read Arabic script. The fact that we have, we have not been able to give so far the ability for people around the world using their own languages and script, the ability to have their own identifiers, it's not a failure itself because it's an evolution in the progress, but it's time for us to correct that one. So I know you're gonna have a lot of smarter people than me on this call. I see Rodrigo, Nicolas and Daniel here, um, and, and they're gonna be helpful to answer any questions and hopefully um, they can give you some thoughts. I wanna leave you with this. You might think that the internet, the fight about the internet is over. It's not, it's just taking a new shape. The new technologies, uh, the new opportunities is something that we can all be a part of. For me, internet is, is an essential driving force in how society can work together all over the world without boundaries, without, uh, without the problems of time delays and, and because of the way we can actually interact with each other. But we have to fight for it. We can't take it for granted. And thank you for joining us on this call because if you understand how the technology works, you will also you will benefit from the discussion how internet governance works. Thank you for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Olga, or am I? No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Joran, and and also thank you for pointing this this idea of the multidisciplinary concept that we you all have to understand technology and, and and the rules that that govern the internet because internet is is an essential part of all the economic and and social and personal activities and and and, and training activities. 
And yesterday, I, I like the, the, what you mentioned, that the social networks are not the internet. They are very important, but not the internet. Yesterday, we could move along with this event, even though the, the social networks were not working. We had internet, and, and, and all the event went very well, thanks to organizations like ICANN and others that make this a stable infrastructure for, for the internet that is so important for all of us. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I can meet you somewhere in the world in, in, in person. Will we have a face-to-face -face ICANN meeting sometime in 2022? Thank you for asking the question that everybody asks me. Um, yes, we will have when we feel it's safe. Okay. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, I want to be honest with when you ask me a question like that because it's important. And I, I mean, we are now seeing, there, maybe for the first time because of vaccination, rates around the world, we started to see the sort of the light in the end of the tunnel, and, and this time it's not a freight train coming towards us. The, the, but we also have to recognize there is a lot of places around the world that has not reached the, the level of vaccinations, for instance. And ICANN being an inclusive and diverse environment has to make sure that people have the ability to express their voices during an ICANN meeting. The, in, in the upcoming ICANN 72 meeting, uh, there's going to be a session how to do what we call a hybrid meeting. How do you combine the best of the virtual world uh, with the best of, of the physical world, which have a face to face? But it all, the first question always comes down to me. How do we secure, how do we make sure that staff, uh, members of the community, and stakeholders come together in a safe environment so we don't risk people's lives? That is the, that's the fundamental question. Some people accuse me of being negative when I say that. No. Maybe I'm your sweetest being realist, but there's, I love working for ICANN. I, I've been doing this for five years, but I'm not willing to send anyone to die for it, to be honest. Was that uh, an answer to your question? I, I would love to see you as well, by of the way. Of course. I think you're realistic. You're not pessimistic. I, I, I fully agree with you, and there are many countries. Also, Latin America is struggling to have all the population vaccinated for uh, now. So I'm, I'm happy I'm happy the two shots, but, uh, but things are still going on. And um, we will see how it evolves. Thank you very much for your time. And I uh, hope I, we, we, meet, we meet again. You too. Thank you very much. I will switch to Spanish now. Hola. Right. Nicolas, I didn't remember what your post was. I have it somewhere here. Here we go. Regional Technical Engagement Manager at ICANN. Well, congratulations. Nicolas Rodrigo is the Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean from ICANN. And Daniel, who is the VP for Brazil. Daniel, hi, you're all friends, right? I, we didn't know that you were going to be joining us today. Who's going to start first, Rodrigo? We have a presentation of yours. Are you in Mexico? Yes, I am, Olga. I am in Mexico, indeed. How lovely. I really miss Mexico, Brazil, Uruguay. I miss traveling the world. Welcome, Rodrigo. We have a presentation by Rodrigo. I did send you some slides to tell you a little bit more about ICANN. Here we go. Thank you, Olga, for the invitation to the, speak on this panel. It's always a pleasure for us to work on with the SSIG and today too. I'm going to give you a swift overview of ICANN. And at the end, I'd like to invite you to visit our online education platform for anybody who wants to learn more about ICANN. We're a complex organization to understand, and yet one that is very interesting and very useful when it comes to internet governance subjects. And then I'll leave Nico and Danielle to talk about our main issue on this panel, which is the change of the RDAP, who is to RDAP protocol. So moving on, 
the way of understanding ICANN is to understand its function. As Goran was saying, every day, everybody who goes onto internet from any platform or a network use something which is originating in ICANN. That has to do the DNS or a domain name system, and those provides the IP addresses and domain names. Uh, so for you to imagine for internet to be a global network and for devices and people connecting it can find each other, there has to be identifiers and these have to be uniform and also unique so that internet can be this one big global network. IP addresses are very long numbers which are hard to memorize by users and that's why we have domain name systems which translates IP addresses into something which is easier to understand which are domain names. Moving on, uh, ICANN does this not itself, as Goran was saying, we do this through different organizations, technical organizations, which enable this to happen. And through DNS, we work with other organizations in the region. One of them is LACNIC, which is the Latin America and Caribbean Network Information Center, and it distributes addresses throughout the region to users using its own procedures and um, gives these to the different ISPs and not to the users. Beyond the technical function, it is a member of the ecosystem contributing to new policies, rules and standards which enable the discussions around internet governance. So ICANN's mission, it's a technical organization, as Goran was saying, our job is to ensure the stable use of these DNS. We have five main functions within our mission. Perhaps we can just leave this up there for you to explore it on our platform Learn. But these can be summarized as to the numbers of IP and the domain names. Moving on, to do what it has to do, the ICANN has these three key values. One of them is to preserve the stability, security, flexibility and openness of DNS and of Internet as a whole. And it has its decision making process employs open policy making, transparent and up bottom up decision making processes. This is very important because it defines ICANN. It allows the private sector and government, academia and all other parties with a particular interest in Internet and DNS to be part of these decision-making processes. And finally, we must function efficiently with excellence, with accountability. As Olga was saying, ICANN has been going from five years. It, has had, it signed a contract with the US five years ago uh, making ICANN responsible, accountable to the community, the global community. And through this process of working with stakeholders, it has continued to exercise the functions enshrined in this agreement in a responsible fashion. We have multiple stakeholder model. We have three support organizations which have to do with names and numbers and our assessment committees have to do with users, end users, governments, 
and two technical instances, one of them which provides a civil assessment to about root servers, and the others has to do with the stability of the system as a whole. Next slide. We have programs aimed at encouraging participation. We have our fellowship program. We have one for young students, which we call Next Gen. And we also have modules for new participants to make involvement in our ecosystem a simpler process. We have information here which will be available for you if you log on to our site. Next slide. I can learn. As I said, we have this program on our educational distance education platform where you can learn about different technical aspects and what ICANN does, as well as about its organization and how its multiple stakeholder model functions, how ICANN produces policies. This is one of the most relevant attributes of ICANN as an organization that produces results, it produces policies where all these stakeholders are involved and define the decisions that will mold the DNS system. So I invite you to become more involved in ICANN and I'd like to ask Nicolas Antoniella to tell you about the RDAP protocol. I invite you to visit the ICANN page. I, I've been a fellow of ICANN for many years. I was a fellow of ICANN ages ago, actually. I was studying this when I was doing my doctorate before I was a fellow, and I always found what they did really interesting when it came to the global coordination of internet. And I've been involved in several different activities. So please do visit the page. There are different kinds of fellowships and things that you can do. Lots of information. It's a really complete page. And there's lots of information in Spanish. And we have our meetings that have been translated into seven different languages, the UN languages and Portuguese. And it's a major change, actually, because that wasn't around when I was there, and the ICANN wasn't around, actually. It's evolved in an extraordinary way. It's fantastic because it enables um, us to use other languages, and, and they also have a simultaneous translation. And frankly, I think it's a great program for everybody to participate. Nicolas or Daniel, are you coming on? The issue today, which is the panel, is all the changes that have been in EU regulations, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, which came out, I remember it was the 25th of May because it's Argentina Independence Day, but I really can't remember exactly what year. And we were talking earlier about data privacy and data governance. It's, it's as if, you know, Europe has positioned itself as the regulatory space, which has an impact on the rest of the world. We saw this yesterday. Everybody is connected. Something doesn't work and it impacts on connectivity, not necessarily Internet itself, but many things which depend on it. And with the cha regulatory changes in privacy in Europe, which impact Europeans and European companies, ICANN has also had to review some of its protocols and the way in which it stores information. The who is, which what is, which provided very important information about who was registering the domain name to a new protocol, which Nicolas is going to tell us about. This is uh, the uh, main subject here, we think it's going to be very important and interesting for our interns. Uh, he was a student of ours, Nicolas in Bogota. I remember when we had his birthday, Bogota 2012, and uh, as the Mintic of Colombia is our host today. So, Nicolas, uh, we have a presentation of yours, right? Yes. 
de la zona ahora esto de la virtualización. Thank you very much, Olga. We have no time zones with the internet in the virtual world. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, then. We're going to um, give a presentation together with Daniel, the objective of which is to present you with some data and to address what who is is, which is the most widely protocol to consult this sort of information. And later, we're going to see the RDAP protocol, RDAP, and the difference with who is. And to give you a snapshot of the two protocols and to have some time for questions and answers and related to internet governance and in the way or how we evolved to the RDIP protocol. You can gather questions as they come along as we go along with the presentation and as soon as we're done probably we can take the, some of the questions or comments, okay? And uh, take advantage to to take those questions. Now, I'll give the floor to Daniel. Daniel, over to you to present the first part of the PowerPoint, and then I continue with our DAP. Hello. Hello, Olga. Greetings from Sao Paulo. OK, that was a very good introduction, introducing the Who is protocol. Now, this protocol was one of the pioneers, one of the first ones. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. The next one. One more. Good. Then who is it's a it's a great trademark. Basically it means who is so it's self explanatory. Is who is responsible for a domain name or for an IP address. It's a database that many organizations can consult as a matter of fact you can consult if you want to know who's the owner of that website or who's responsible or the responsible party the registration personal data okay phone number whatever next slide this protocol dates back to 1982 at that time, it was the very beginning of the internet. It was the beginning of academic studies of the internet. Somebody could call a responsible party and said, OK, your website is not doing well. I think that you need to change or check your server. And basically, that depended on a telephone list of IP addresses. This was the beginning. And the Huawei service remained the same and uh, more or less was very important for law enforcement, for lawyers that were involved in trademarks and copyright and patents. Now, the environment, as Olga said, the regulatory framework at the international level changed. So an open database with so much information with personal data it's not the best solution and Nicholas is going to discuss RDAP and how it evolved or how who is evolved into this new protocol thank you next slide I call them slides slides in English um, a ver, ¿qué es el protocolo RDAP entonces? El, el protocolo RDAP es un, un protocolo de acceso. The RDAP AP protocol is having access to the registration and allows users to have access to that registration data when you register the domain name, as Daniel said. So it's the same registration data that were housed in Hues right now they are available through the RDAP protocol 
It was developed by the Internet Working Group at the IETF, replacing or substituting the HOIS protocol. Now, the idea is that RDAP is a protocol of data delivery, registration data delivery, just like HOIS, but its implementation is a little bit different from the implementation of HOIS because it is standardized or it standardizes the access to data and the formats of queries and consultation. HOIS doesn't have a clearly defined standard, not even in the query or in the answer, not even in the way of saving or hosting the data. These are databases are well distributed. They are not in a single repository, but the data are saved in different servers across the world by different organizations. So, in a way, this was a wake-up call to have more standardization in the way we save data and in the way we perform queries and answers in the format of answers. Now, from that point, RDAP does perform or does resolve or aggregate those standards and functionalities unlike what we used to have with the HOIS protocol. And it has many advantages in connection with HOIS. We're going to mention quite a few. My web background, it includes support for internationalization. HOIS, for example, doesn't have this native support. It does include some mechanisms for having secure access to this data and the capacity or capability to provide anonymity to this data. And that was not provided by WHOIS, and that, that is the great difference. In this way, we see how friendly the protocol is in connection with who is in line with the prevailing standards and the regulations and the new trends of standardization like GDPR. Let's go to the next slide. Las diferencias the difference between RDAP and HUIS, because is, is, is huge. I mean, some information was not ready available. For example, internalization, secure access, differentiated access to data, the way you perform queries, and the way you receive those answers to those queries. They were acknowledged as a lack of information or failures or deficiencies, something that was missing in the HOIS protocol. Okay, So we wanted some kind of um, data query. So RDAP basically emerged as a way to solve or to bridge those deficiencies. And finally, in the year 2011, the steering committee or the consulting committee of ICANN advised that the ICANN community assess and adopt a substitution protocol called or referred to as RDAP or RDAP. There you have the hyperlink in the presentation. You can have access and refer to this information have further information of all these details that we're mentioning. So we work with a discussion group on registrations, registrars, and people registering domain of the TLDs to have a basic profile of RDAP to use this, to use it especially for the GTLDs. That profile was defined and it follows suit or is in line with the requirements of the temporal specification for data registration of GTLDs that repositories 
or registration en uh, entities shall comply with when hosting this GTLD and basically the objective of this specification implies guidelines to the registration agencies on the way they should implement an RDAP service efficiently or effectively complying with the standard. So these systems are not centralized. However, they are widely spread in different organizations like registrars. So the state basically, in a way, provides guidelines or requirements to keep consistency in the registrations and to administer or manage the queries and the information that is provided. This is a general scheme on the way we have this ECHA system for who is an RDAP or RDAP. So as you can see, it's a distributed um, system. So you have those that register, file a domain name. We have the registrar, the entity before which I register my domain name is the way I go shopping, basically, for that domain name. Then I have the registration entity, basically, is the one that starts implementing the domain name. And that is the one that keeps the DNS registration for that domain name that I purchase, etc. So we have the registrar, the registration agency, and the RIR, that is the local regional organizations, are these are five organizations. You have Latin America and the Caribbean, North America, Africa, and Asia Pacific and Europe. So these are five organizations responsible for delegating redirection of IPs and IPv4, IPv6. Usuarios de esos recursos. ¿sí? Entonces, ¿quiénes contribuyen? or to this database who basically saves uh, this and this is uh, we compile this with the local registrations and with the domain names and users are the ones that we consume that information okay so in this scheme we have a snapshot of who does that and who consumes this data, okay? Who is an RDAP? They are public access database that are readily available for any person. And we're going to add some information that comes out of obligations created by standards or regulations, okay? And RDAP adapts more effectively, better than who is. Next one. We said that RDAP provided confidentiality and anonymity when exchanging information okay, with the system. This is not something that is provided by the RDAP protocol, but this is designed to work on HTTPS. That is all the access to information and information exchange is used by using HTTPS or a lower level, or in a way, basically it works over HTTPS and basically inherits all the advantages. It allows encryption of information transfer between the client and the, RD, the RDAP server. So only the client and only the server can view it. And it provides a secure channel or privacy when exchanging this sort of information. And confidentiality, privacy in the exchange of information and authentication mechanisms because you have certification management. When you speak with a server and not somebody that is disguised as a server so you can authenticate the, orig the origin or the source of information by authenticating this 
um, records. So here you have a clear difference between the Whois uh, protocol that did not have this advantage. Next one. La, el, si nos referimos a los tipos de consultas, o sea, ¿qué es lo que yo... If we refer to the queries or what information I can find in the RDAP system, basically the same that is readily available in the host protocol. RDAP doesn't change the sort of information that I'm retrieving through who is the information is readily available but right now I have a standardized system for queries and for saving information these are some of the, con the queries that I can perform I can go to that database in RDAP and say okay I look for a domain name I have a domain name I query that information I get the um, name of the entity and I said okay I would like to have information associated to that register right or registry I would like to know the DNS servers for example for that organization or for that domain name so I have the IP address and I would like to know who that IP has been delegated to in the regional organizations and who uses that DNS or what IP has been delegated that DNS and I can ask or perform a query an IP address so I have an autonomous name and I would like to know who has the delegation of that autonomous name so I can query that in the RDAP and the information is going to provide me with that information these are some of the queries by which I can ask the system the RDAP says that is extensible I virtually can add any sort of information even there's um, an extension I mean you can add an extension that is analyzed by a working group of experts by IANA and once the query is approved you develop that extension and you can add basically that sort of uh, consultation and functionalities. RDAP natively and by design it supports all internationalized domain names in queries and in answers. Olga, I don't know if you discuss what are domain names that are internationalized domain names or IDNs. Okay, these IDNs Typically, before we spoke about the internationalization of domain names, correct me if I'm wrong, Rodrigo, or correct me if I need to add something. Before existing this concept of IDN, a domain name should contain only ASCII standardized characters or only associated to the English language. For example, my name Nicholas in Spanish has a stress, an accent on the A, and that was impossible to include it. Goran, for example, has like a roof on top of the O. The same goes for French. I mean, the different accents in French or characters in Arabic, in Greek, or in Latin, or in Chinese, those characters were never included. So by internationalizing the domain names, it allowed for the aggregation of characters that could not happen before. Who is does not support this natively, but RDAP does support this. So if I have an international domain name in Arabic, I could use or I could type in Arabic with characters and if he has characters in Arabic he would return the query in line with the language that I specify which is a great advantage of having an internationalization of domain names and characterizing the types of languages and the type or the way we write characters when querying for domain names next one okay finally let me present you with some examples 
These are the quiz queries. This is the interface that we use. But for quiz and for RDAP, you're going to have ways of querying the database by command lines. So you have um, some kind of a DOS command, and then you have the query that is pinged to the screen. You are making queries in the host database. In this case, is information associated to the icon the name .org. and the answers are is what is below. So that format that could um, seem intricated or complex that it could take some time to understand depending on the server that provides the system because it's not standardized. So the query or the answer could be in a different order or the data could be found in different places. And data are going to be presented in a different way depending on the server that I query. Next one. Now here, there's another example. Instead of querying a domain name, I'm asking for an IP address. So I would like to know, in this case, what is the information related to the IPv4 address. In this case, this is number. And it provides me with that information to the fixed IP. And if I go to ICANN.org, that has been delegated to ICANN. So it's an IPv4 prefix used by ICANN. And here you have the domain name, the contact information as well as the technical information of the contact and all of that. So it's public domain information that anybody could have access to by querying and by installing the WHOIS client and thus basically doing the, the queries in this format. Here we have another query asking for autonomous system just like the others. But here we made changes in the query in the system. So basically, we provide an autonomous system and we get the associated number. Who is this information delegated to? This is delegated to one, to one of the autonomous system of ICANN. It provides me with the name of the organization, the address that was filed in the register, technical contact, any emails and I need to report a use or a problem or an issue or troubleshooting or whatever if I want to contact that information or that organization, I'm sorry. Next one. And here we have an RDAP uh, query. Here we have a website that is exactly the same. So it provides me with a field uh, require fields, so it's a client of RAD, uh, RDAP making queries, and I am presented with that information. In the example, for example, um, when we query icon.org, let me see if we can see that in the in the next slide and the next one, please. You can see that the information. You can see that the information, as I was telling you, RDAP has a standardized response. If you see that at first glance, it's not user-friendly. But it's a format that is called GJZone format that is specifies certain information that allows you to put that in order or to assign certain title. So the tool that presents me with that information, in this case a website, it can do, for example, a way of sorting that is uh, sorting that in a user-friendly manner or fashion. So it has registration name or registration information, who's the owner, who's the registrar, information of the NSSEC, if the domain name manages domain SEC, if it's signed, the resources, who are the authoritative servers. And here you have some space to include notes or remarks, text of any kind that you may copy to add information. So in this way, you clearly see the difference 
in queries and the way we present information and the freedom to have to present in an orderly fashion this sort of information. Next one. And finally, here Here, with Daniel, we wanted to pose this question. And probably Daniel and Olga can throw the first stone or make a comment here. It says, after everything that we have seen so far, does this mean that our DAP is trying to resolve something that is not broken or reinventing the wheel? We're trying to fix what is not broken. What it comes to my mind is an existential doubt or a transcendental doubt. RDAP was supposedly to provide a direct access to the who is information. However, what you explained, and I confess that I have not studied in detail, that's why we have you as a panelist. From what I've seen is that you can have access to the information I can make the squares in our DAP. So what would be the main difference between the WHOIS and the RDAP that changed the functionality and adapted to or ad was adapted the new privacy regulation in the European Union and this RDAP? Okay, let me tell you. Probably Daniel can add or join me for some comments. From the technical standpoint, RDAP adds a functionality that is exactly what you're saying. If it were just changing the way we present the information, it wouldn't be an, it wouldn't be providing any benefits. We would be changing one protocol for another. Yeah, you could be with standardized information, having security, those are benefits, these are things for from the point of view of using friendliness with the prevailing regulations with the new regulatory trends there wouldn't be any problems or there wouldn't be any changes now with the current regulation of gdpr that you mentioned that you were saying i think dates back to may 25th 2018 three years ago time flies with the pandemic Okay, that regulation or that standard, part of it, specified that some of the personal data or the data that were of public domain, who is, right now, they lie under anonymity and they are protected as personal data, so nobody could access that. So you can hide the ownership of that website. So what who is permits is the differential access to data. Even though there's not a practical implementation of differentiated data that are accessible massively in a public domain or in the public domain sphere, what is preferential access to data? That means I can create users in our DAP, not in HOES. Of public domain, somebody that doesn't have any credentials, regulatory credentials, could have the common information or the common access of public domain, period. That is information that is not protected under a law, and that would be a public domain, so I can make the query to RDAP, and it's exactly the same of the query to who is over the advantages, the way of presenting and diversity, confidentiality, whatever. Now, if I were to be a law enforcement agency, okay? like the police, uh, a data protection agency, the judiciary, or whatever, that under the request of the judiciary organ in its jurisdiction may request data that are covered by a data protection law. For example, the judiciary or the judiciary uh, organization here in your way may request it and not an individual so I 
would provide credentials to that judicial organization and through RDAP I could have access to information that is not a public domain and that is the main difference with who is so it makes it more user-friendly and more compatible and in line with the regulations that we have in place or in effect with a new regulatory framework so there's a registration for data agencies or for judges or for district attorneys prosecutors what is the procedure imagine that I'm the prosecutor the federal prosecutor of Argentina responsible for investigating cyber crime and I would like to have access to a certain domain Daniel could you comment on this I had this question and perhaps Rodrigo can help me the strata or layers of access levels according to the accreditation of institutions around the world such as the police they have different access levels but this is still under discussion how can we get this global accreditation uh, to work that's right I think that the first issue is that we need to talk about the technical improvements of the protocol of data access, the RDAP, which we've been something working on for some time, which isn't immediately linked to the GDPR. And the other is the co contents of the database, which is also undergoing changes thanks to the new legislation about data protect, personal data protection. Before, this was a public database, and then people could check, out, check it out, and anybody could access it. Now, what's changing are the levels of access. There are different proposals being di discussed and each of the records holders and the registration agencies need to ensure to make sure what kind of information is accessible to the public, what can be accessed uh, when an authority makes a request, which could be an administrative or a legal authority, and then finally what role ICANN should play to facilitate these accreditations and enable access. The, both of these things have to be put in the balance. Access to information for security purposes, issues that have to do with the functioning of the system itself, and the other is the, how we care for people's personal information. But I think people have explained it very well. Well, I would like to add something, Olga. Is it fair, as Rodrigo and Daniel were saying, is, 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 this is exactly what we're doing at the moment. We are working to see the best way of implementing this. Now, technically, RDAP can take this, but who is didn't? RDAP allows us to make differentiated access, and the implementation of this access is what we are developing. That's why we're saying that currently we don't have function versions that are up and running of these functions. We're trying to define this today if you are working with a legal or judicial organization which tend to s request information from the, about a domain or an IP address, wh what you get is one-to-one -one agreements. You have to have an agreement and the judicial organization, for example, has to contact the registry and agree and validate their credentials and it has to authenticate itself as a valid judicial organization and then they have these one-on-one -on -one agreements now RDAP wants to standardize that mechanism and achieve a way of solving this at global level rather than at a one-on-one -on -one to level and that's what we're working on the key thing from a technical point of view about this protocol is that it's absolutely functional and supported by the protocol. What we need to do now is how to solve this issue of implementation. Technical issues being resolved, and so we're looking at implementation with policies and regulations. Okay, 
for anybody who's interested, the discussions continue in ICANN. It is a, a hard, quite hard to keep up with it sometimes, but everybody can participate. And I believe that you are going to be having a meeting about this shortly, right? What's the date? The 25th to the 28th of October, that's the, the largest, the longest meeting this year, right? Is that Seattle time, right? You know, California, it's uh, east, it's west coast, right? For Latin America, it'll be UTC minus five. It's okay, it's okay as far as timing go. The, the most difficult thing for me was a meeting in Kuala Lumpur because I had to get up like, you know, in the middle of the night. So this one will be about after lunch. You can see the agenda on the ICANN, just sign up, it's free. All the meetings are open, and now and there are some very interesting presentations coming up, which are not only about the working groups from ICANN, but they will be dealing with also more general issues, such as the multi-stakeholder participation, and probably dealing with RDAP. Probably, I can't remember the agenda exactly, but um, but I will dedicate myself to learning the agenda off by heart. So if you're interested, please just sign up. Just listen to how the meetings are developed. There is translation. There's lots of information on the ICANN page. The questions I have now are very similar to the ones that I had actually thought of. Let me see. Olga. Yes. There's a case that RDAP has already used for to solve a personal issue, and I think it's interesting to share. We found a site which was showcasing some really, really cheap products. So we started checking it out. This is this is a fraudulent website which has a, a different domain names. So what did I do? I copied the domain name and I put it in bluecop.icann.org, which is our follow-up system. And uh, it gave me information, not about the wrongdoer and their address, but I have information about who registered the site, which company, registered the website in the name of this wrongdoer, this criminal. And thereby comes the question about ICANN coordination. All of these companies that register domain names like have to have to have abuse channels open Hot, these would be whistleblower channels, actually, to receive complaints. I entered a hosting site, and, you know, this is a typical case of abuse. You have to call it out. I'm, probably the site is already offline. But you can do that, too. Everybody can do this. And you should activate these whistleblower channels to ensure that internet is a safer place, a more secure place, and for these fraudulent websites to be pushed out. So that's my two cents worth. I wanted to comment on that for those who don't know so much about it. My, my question was, was, why would somebody register somebody else who was a criminal? And the answer is, of course, we don't know they're a criminal, right? Because the registers are automated. If somebody wants to register my nicolas.com.uy, they can just register it. And, but the register has no relationship at all, has no idea what I'm going to do with that domain name. It doesn't have any idea what the website was going to do. Uh, they have, I. I could do anything with that domain name. I could put an illegal business up there or whatever. 
So the, there are these mechanisms whereby if one discovers, detects or suspects that a particular website is undertaking fraudulent activity, you cannot report it to these whistleblower channels on the RDAP. And if the registrar gets it, they have a number which directly associates them to the domain name. So the registrar will carry out the necessary investigation and pass the information to the authorities to carry out the right investigation. And if they determine, I can obviously it's not involved at all. The client who carries out the investigation, who, who reported it, doesn't get involved either. No data is released because it's totally anonymous, this claim. But at the end of the day, if at the end of the investigation carried out by the competent body concludes that it is illicit activity, they can re request the registrar to eliminate the register so that the domain name is no longer delegated to that person or organization which was carrying out the fraudulent activity. Just to give you an idea of what's behind all of this and what uh, each person's role is. So the community does have an important role to play. Website users need to be educated to understand and spot these kinds of fraudulent activities and understand also what resources are available so that they can file claims and and have the appropriate investigations carried out. You, but you, you might suspect something and that you could be wrong. Maybe it's not on a list of activity, but you know, you, you've got to, you've got to be careful. You know, there are two sides to each story, obviously. Well, people, okay, our time is up. I love this panel. I'm technician, so I loved it. I haven't had the chance to study this in detail, but I think it was very clear. I will be sharing the presentations with all our interns, and thank you very much. Lovely to see you again. I hope that, as Goran said, that we can meet again at the next ICANN meeting in person. I think that last year there were all online meetings, right? And the meeting that was going to be in Cancun in March was virtual. And then it's all been online since then. So, so stay safe, stay in good health. Big hugs from Buenos Aires and from Adrián, who's waving and from all the team here, the te technical team, we're a family here. Have a good rest of day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.